Hey math students, how you doing? Today I want to talk about exponential identities. And actually what I want to do is I want to review exponential identities. This is probably not a good video if uh, you've never seen this before. We're going to go kind of quick. Um, and you may be thinking, identities? What are you talking about identities? What, is, what does that mean? Oh, I'll tell you. A mathematical identity is, it's like a fun fact. Um, it is a statement of equality. This thing equals this thing. Uh, and it's a statement that is fairly general. Here's an example. The Pythagorean theorem. That's a mathematical identity. A squared equals, sorry, A squared plus B squared. I forgot it. A squared plus B squared equals C squared in the context of a right triangle where A and B are the legs and C is the, the hypotenuse. Um, another identity might be, or not might be, another identity is uh, the difference of squares that a plus b times a minus b is a squared minus b squared. Okay, It's true for every single a, it's true for every, every single b, and it's a very handy thing to have in your back pocket. So uh, let's look at some, log some exponential sorry, uh, identities. So exponent exponential identity number one is, hold on a second, what is an exponent? Let's, let's, let's just go all the way back to the beginning. Exponents are to multiplication as multiplication is to addition. All right? When you were a little kid and they first taught you multiplication, they taught it to you as a shortcut to adding a whole bunch of numbers. Instead of adding 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4 plus 4, you did 4 times 5. Okay, it's so much easier. Well, the same thing here. Instead of doing... 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, you just take 4 to the 5th power, 1024. And it's so much easier. So, uh, so that's kind of what it means. It means multiplying something by itself a number of times. At least, that's how it was initially meant. Because just like multiplication, we, 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 we come up with this concept thinking of natural numbers, okay, positive integers. And then later on, we see the patterns and we see, well, the identities. And, uh, and so then we expand our idea of what that might be. And here's, here's an example. Uh, 4 times negative 2. Is that 4 added to itself negative 2 times? No, that doesn't make any sense, okay? You can't add something to itself negative 2 times. However, you can multiply 4 times negative 2 and get negative 8. So what we've done is we expanded our idea of what multiplication is. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to expand our idea of what an exponent is by looking at positive integer exponents, but also by looking at negative exponents, fractional exponents, irrational exponents. <gasps> okay, anyway, let's get to it. So identity number one, a to the m power times a to the n power is a to the m plus n power. Okay? For positive integers, this is just so obvious, okay? If I take uh, a to the third times a to the second power, well, a to the third is going to be a times a times a, and then I'm going to multiply that times a times a for a to the second power. Well, what do I have? I have a times a times a times a times a. That's a to the fifth power, and I've could've, I could have gotten there just by adding up my exponents, okay? So this one is sort of intuitively obvious for a whole bunch of people, that a to the m times a to the n is a to the m plus n. And once you get that down, it's not a big leap to see that a to the m divided by a to the n equals a to the m minus n, all right? Uh, basically, just do this divided by this, and you'll get that, and that pretty much proves uh, identity number two. Identity number three. A to the n to the m power equals a to the m times n. Okay? Which also equals a to the m to the n power. So basically, the order doesn't matter of your exponents right there. Uh, let's look at an example. Let's see, uh, let's say I had 4 to the second 
to the third. Well, that's going to equal uh, four to the, ooh, no, no. <laughs> Let's do something I actually know. Two to the second to the third, that's a little better. Uh, two to the second to the third power is going to be four to the third, which is going to be 64, okay? But it's also going to be two times two times two times two times two times two, two to the sixth power, which is 64. We can just multiply those, uh, those exponents there. And it's also two to the third to the second power, which is eight squared, which is 64. Three different ways of getting to that 64. All right? But the long and short of it is, if you have something to a power to another power, you end up multiplying those exponents. And again, I think once you play around with, uh, uh, with uh, some small positive integers, you can see that that's gonna be true. So those are the big three, okay? Those are the ones that, from those we get all the other ones. Uh, and, uh, oh, one more thing I want to note, I want to point out, and that is on the second one, we divided. When you divide, make sure you're not dividing by zero. So that means if this is true, this is going to be true only if A is not equal to zero. I've got to include that. Okay, so now let's keep going. Let's say, what is A to the one power? Well, A to the one power is... A. I think most of us know that. Uh, of course, A squared, A to the second power is A times A. Uh, a to the third power is A times A times A. Uh, a to the one power, I guess, would just be that first A, and you don't have to multiply it uh, times anything. Or another way to think about it, about it would be uh, A to the third power is A to the second times A, right? Well, that means a to the third divided by a to the second is a. And a to the third divided by a to the second is a to the three minus two, which is one. So that's another way of looking at why a to the one power must be just a, okay? So anything to the one power is just itself. Number five, what about a to the zero power? Well, isn't zero just one minus one? And that would be, according to this, a to the 1 over a to the 1, and anything over itself is just 1, as long as that thing is not equal to 0. Okay? So anything to the 0 power equals 1, but because we divided there, that a cannot be equal to 0 itself. 0 to the 0 power is impossible to evaluate. It's, it's, uh, it's called indeterminate, okay? It's impossible to determine exactly what it is. All right, number 6. Uh, we did 1, we did 0. Let's do negative 1. a to the negative 1 power. Well, isn't negative 1 just 0 minus 1? So that would be a to the 0 minus 1. And again, don't I just divide? That's going to be a to the 0 divided by a to the 1. A to the 0, I know that that's uh, 1. And A to the 1, I know that that's A. So A to the negative 1 is just 1 over A. So to the negative 1 power means the reciprocal of that number. Okay? 4 to the negative 1, 1 fourth. Uh, negative 2 to the negative 1, negative 1 half. 2 thirds to the negative 1, 3 halves. Okay? You just flip the fraction when you take the reciprocal of it. All right. Okay, well, what about, what about other negative numbers? What, what about a to the negative n power, okay? Well, negative n is just n times negative 1, right? So this is a to the n power. Oh, and when I multiply uh, exponents, that's like saying it's a to the n to the negative 1. Ha uh ha! -huh. And anything to the negative 1 power is 1 over that thing, so this is 1 over a to the n. So if I have a negative exponent, anything to a negative exponent, it's simply the reciprocal of that same base. By the way, a, this number a, is called the base. Okay? It's the reciprocal of that same base to the positive power. Okay? Just make the, make the exponent positive. All right. So that basically tells us 
uh, how to evaluate any integer fraction. Okay? So, uh, uh, positive integers, negative integers, all of those, uh, uh, all of those uh, exponents. Did I say fraction? I should have said exponents. I'm sorry. Any integer exponent uh, we, we, can, we can evaluate. Now let's look at fractional exponents. Let's look at uh, a to the one half. All right. So a to the one half power. If I have a to the one half power. Oops, it's kind of faint. Let's use this one. A to the one half power. And if I multiply it by itself, another way of multiplying something by itself is to square it. If I square this, I would get, well, I know from this uh, identity right here that I multiply the exponents. So this would be a to the one half times two, and one half times two is one, and a to the one is just a. So a to the one half squared is a. Well, what number squared gets me a? The square root of a. That's pretty much the definition of what the square root is. So that means a to the one half power is the square root of a. And I think you can see that there's nothing special about the two here. We could have used a to the one fifth and taken that to the fifth power, and that would also get us a. So what that tells me is a to the one fifth would be the fifth root of a, and in general, a to the 1 over n is going to give me the nth root of a. All right, that is a, uh, uh, that's an important one. And it's also important at this point that we say, just like on number 2, where we said a is not equal to 0, well, if I'm taking roots, uh, like a square root, or if n is any even number here, I have to make sure that a is positive, okay? Greater than or equal to zero. And we already said before that a is not going to be uh, equal to zero, so it's just going to be greater than zero. So really for all, uh, for all of our purposes here, our, our base is going to be a number that's greater than zero. If the base is zero, then it all becomes really trivial anyway. Zero to the anything power is always just, just zero, except for zero to the zero power, which is indeterminate. Uh, and then negative numbers to powers, it's, it's impossible to graph and it's, it's very hard to evaluate because they flip-flop between uh, negative and positive depending on whether your exponent's uh, uh, even or odd. And if you have a fractional, like, we're not going to go there. Okay. Last one. And the last one is, what about some other fraction? Instead of 1 over uh, a number, what about a to the m over n power? Well, m over n is like saying m times 1 over n, right? Yeah. So this is a to the m times 1 over n, which is a to the m to the 1 over n, which is the nth root of a to the m power. Okay? That's one way to do it. There's actually another way to do it. And that is to, we can either do it this way or that way. We can say uh, the nth root of a to the m power, okay? The only difference here is a difference of order. In this first one, I took a to, uh, the, mth pow to the m power first, and then I took the nth root. Over here, I took uh, the nth root of a first, and then I took it to the m power. And one of the things I'm telling you is, it doesn't matter. The order is the same, and that's because of the commutative law of multiplication. Order doesn't matter. All right. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that we can now take a to any fractional power, and fractional is just another word for rational. That means that we have uh, figured out how to find uh, uh, how to evaluate an exponent for any rational exponent at all. Now you may be saying, yeah, well, what about irrational exponents? Well, good for you. Um, evaluating irrational exponents, basically what you do is you find a rational number that's very, very close to it, which you can always do. 
and uh, and then you estimate the uh, um, the the answer that way. For example, if I want to take two to the pi power for I don't know why I would want to do that, but let's say I want to do it. Uh, if I want to take two to the pi power. What would I do? Well, I would say it is very very close to two to the three point one four one five nine two six power. Okay. Uh, or if I wanted to take five to the square root of two power, I would say that's very very close to five to the one point four one four two one three five six two power, uh, because that's a number that is very very close to the square root of two. So depending on how close you want to get to it, just take your exponent to that many more digits uh, and do it that way. Okay, so last thing I want to go over is this. I want to graph an exponential function. Okay, I want to Let's choose a function that's not going to give us too much trouble. Uh, let's choose the function um, y equals 2 to the x power. All right. So I guess the first thing we need is a couple of axes. So here's my y. Here's my x. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1, 2, 3, 4. And so let's see. Let's just start with the, the y-intercept when x is 0. y is going to be 2 to the 0 power. Well, anything to the 0 power, I know what that is. That's 1. And note, anything to the 0 power is 1. So that means if I'm graphing y equals something to the x power, I already know it's going to go through the point zero, 01. All right, cool. And then 2 to the 1 power, well, remember anything to the 1 is just itself. So this will go through the point 1, 2. And 2 to the second power, well, that's 2 times 2, that's 4. So 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. And you can see it's increasing there. 2 to the third power is going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this starts getting pretty pretty steep, okay? Uh, meanwhile, going off to the left, 2 to the negative 1 power, okay, to the negative 1, that's a reciprocal. So that's going to be 1 over 2, 1 half. We'll put it like right there. 2 to the negative 2 power uh, is 1 over 2 to the second, which is 1 over 4. So, ooh, okay, I'll try to do that. And what we find is, when we go to the right, each time x steps up by 1, y doubles. And as we go to the left, each time x goes down by 1, y gets cut in half. So we get closer and closer and closer to the y-axis without ever touching it, but it gets very, very small. And what do we call that line that we get so close to? Oh, yes, it's an asymptote. Okay? And the other thing that I can see here is, hmm, uh, the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 2 to the x power is 0. Okay? That's because of that asymptote. As you go off to the left towards negative infinity, it goes to 0. As you go off to the right, as it goes towards infinity, it does not exist, okay? This limit does not exist. The limit as x goes to infinity because it just blows up to infinity itself. But this way, it does get closer and closer and closer to a number, and that number is zero. All right, so that's, uh, that's one graph. Let me graph, uh, let me do another one. Let's do y equals one half to the x power, okay? So this time, uh, um, 1 half to the 0 power, still 1. 1 half to the 1 power is 1 half. 1 half to the second power is 1 fourth. This is sounding familiar. Oh, yeah, it's just like this over here. Okay, so it's just getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis. 
What about one half to the negative one power? Well, that's a reciprocal of one half, which is two. So one half to the negative one is two. And one half to the negative two is one over one half to the second, which is one over one fourth, which is four. So two, and I go one, two, three, four. And you might be saying to yourself, hey, that's the exact same graph, just flipped over the y-axis. You're right. And then you might also say to yourself, well, flipping something over the, uh, the y-axis, I can get that just by replacing x with negative x. You're right again. Does that mean that one half to the x power is just two to the negative x power? Yes, it does. Think about it, two to the negative x, that equals one over two to the x, and one over two to the x, and one half to the x power are exactly the same thing. All right. So let's look at some more, uh, oh, by the way, notice on this one that the limit as x goes to positive infinity of one half to the x power, that actually does exist, and that's zero. But the limit as x goes to negative infinity of one half to the x power, that one does not exist, okay? So you always get a limit in one direction, but not in the other direction. And which direction you get a limit, it depends on, on, uh, on the value of this base here, whether it's one half to the x or two to the x. Basically, if your base is less than one, that is to say between zero and one, uh, then you're gonna get a limit going off to the right of zero. And if your base is greater than one, then you're gonna get a limit going off to the left of zero. All right, so what I wanna do now is I wanna look at some more graphs of y equals a of x, but I wanna do it on my computer because it's a lot easier to, uh, to, to mess with the parameters that way. So let me open up a computer page here real fast. Okay. So you'll see here that uh, um, we have y equals a to the x, and a to the x right now, a is 2, and so sure enough, it goes to the point 0, 1, and 1, 2, and that's that swoop up, up to the right that we saw before. But let's, uh, let's make a be a little bigger. Let's make a be 3, and what happens? Well, it just gets steeper, okay? Now we're going through the point zero one. We still go through the point zero one, but now we're going through uh, the point one three. And if we just make a bigger and bigger, what happens is it just stretches up and up and up and up and up. Okay, here's four to the x. So you can always tell what the base is just by saying, well, what's what's the y when uh, uh, when x equals one? Uh, because a to the one power is going to equal a. And then if we go the other direction and let a get smaller, then it sort of flattens down and then swings up to the left. Aha. Uh -huh. So here is a equals 0.5 to, uh, to the x power. And this is what we graphed on the board a second ago. So it goes to the point negative 1, 2, and it goes to the point negative two, four. And let's say we had uh, a equals um, point, uh, point two. Okay, point two to the x power, it starts to get really, really uh, steep. And when we're at negative one, uh, we would be, we would have the point negative one and five, because five is 0.2 to the negative one power. So basically what you see is any time that a is a number between zero and one, it's gonna have that big swoop up to the left. And any time that a is between, uh, or just greater than one, it's gonna have the big swoop up to the right. And the farther from one that a is, the steeper that graph is gonna be, okay? That's what we're seeing. All right. What does this tell us? Well, it tells us a few things. It tells us uh, some properties, some, uh, some identities about uh, exponents. It tells us some uh, properties about the graph of exponents. And I guess the, the very last thing that I wanna mention is 
Why do we care? Why do we care about this? Well, it's because exponential functions are extremely useful in modeling. And uh, in particular, they're very, very uh, useful in modeling the growth of something, okay? Because if you think about it, uh, how, uh, how much something grows, like a, a population, for example, a population of people or dogs or fish or bacteria or whatever you have, how many, uh, how fast that population grows depends on how big the population is itself, okay? If I have a population of 10 and it increases by 100, well, that's just, you know, it's, it's 11 times as big as it used to be. But if I have a population of uh, 1,000 and it increases by 100, well, that's only an increase of 10%, okay? So uh, populations generally, uh, uh, they, they, they grow by by multiplying by something, okay? So you, you end up getting uh, an exponential function or a geometric sequence, depending on how you want to model it. Uh, and, and uh, well, and another thing that grows exponentially is money, okay? How much interest you make? Well, it depends on how much money you have to start with. So exponential functions are used to model both population growth and financial growth as well, okay? Uh, see you at the next video. Bye-bye.